Welcome to StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from StartupRad.io, your startup podcast and YouTube blog from and for the German-speaking startup scene. Today, I'm bringing you a bonus episode on the 26th of December 2022. And I would like to welcome Antonio to our bonus episode as our subject matter expert. Hey, Antonio, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing good as well. Um, by the way, good afternoon to Singapore because you attend us from there. Um, as always, I add a little bit context to this. Um, in Germany, the 26th is a public holiday. So basically everything is shut down and usually you cannot expect to reach somebody there. So we thought it would be a good idea to give them some food for thought on what was going on in FTX. Therefore, I have Antonia as a guest. You are a professor of economics at INSEAD, Singapore campus, with a PhD from Harvard University in economics. And you are also a research fellow at the Center for Economic and Policy Research in London. And you've worked as a consultant for international organizations such as the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, OECD, and the World Bank. So, Welcome again to our episode as a subject matter expert. And we would like to talk a little bit about FTX, exploring a little bit what we know. I'm sure within the next, let's say, five years, a lot more details will pop up. And maybe we are wrong with a little bit what we're saying here, but we can only talk about what we know so far. Could you give us a little brief introduction how FTX looked for you right now i mean right now of course it's a it's a failed financial institution um they entered bankruptcy um it's a in many ways a classic case of a financial institution going bad uh, a combination of poor management and from what we know today possibly fraud as well um, I think what is special in this case, uh, what is different from others is, of course, FTX lives in the crypto world. Uh, it's a cryptocurrency exchange together with other associated financial institutions that do things like being a hedge fund, but mostly it's a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, and because it was one of the main cryptocurrency exchanges, it is not just one more story of something failing. I think it's a, it's a moment of maybe a wake up call for people in this world or all of us. Uh, and we're all asking questions. Uh, was there something special? Was there something that was special because of this was a cryptocurrency exchange and not a regular bank or a regular hedge fund? Mm -hmm. As you say, a regular bank or regular hedge fund, because maybe somebody is seeing it from the outside, having no background in financial services. For them, it all looks the same. But a crypto exchange is something really, really different from a regulated exchange, let's say NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange in the US or Deutsche Börse here in Frankfurt, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's very hard to talk about what a regulated cryptocurrency exchange is because there's not clear model for regulation of these exchanges. FTX mostly was doing business outside of the US in the Bahamas, where regulation is very lax and nothing compared to what you see in Germany or in the US or in Singapore, where I live. Uh, there was an arm of FTX that was called FTX.US that was sort of regulated, but it was not regulated in the standard way. For example, it was not regulated by the SEC. Uh, and, and the regulation that it had, it, it, it was not at all comparable with the regulation that you would have for a regular exchange. Uh, so so th there was an element of regulation, at least in part of it. But again, that regulation was minimal compared to what you would think an exchange. And in addition, a broker, because they're not just an exchange, they also operated as a broker, a broker should have. Uh, and again, that's something that, of course, we're revisiting as we speak, which is w w what is it that we should have done differently? What is it that we should do better going forward? For our audience out there, as you said, a regulated financial institution is something completely different. They have to post a lot of collateral. Um, when when they have deals going on, 
on inside the stock exchange, they usually have a central counterparty. Both sides have to post collateral where you cannot use your own create your own created tokens and stuff like that. So there's a lot, lot more to this. It goes down to some regulations on how to have you have to do some businesses and the authorities can send somebody in an auditor and they audit if you really stick to those regulations. And if you really, really want to see um, an executive in a German financial service company sweat, <laughs> tell them such <laughs> such an audit is coming and th they can be really tough. And as we said, that only holds true for regulated financial institutions and it did not hold true for the cryptocurrencies. For the crypto exchange here um is is there who actually regulated ftx us when it was not the sec again i think what happens in the us that there's a multitude of organizations agencies that in, are involved in regulation some of them operate at the state level not at the federal level uh, again, that is an issue that is an issue that is well known for anyone who studies regulation in the US. We understand that is not at all ideal, but, but it is what it is. And for regular institutions, we found if you want an equilibrium that works. So clearly the, the way these things are done should be a lot more centralized at the federal level and not at the state level. But because the US is obviously a, a decentralized uh, country, you have these sort of weird agencies that operate at different levels. So FT FTX US was partially regulated at the state level, partially at the federal level, clearly not ideal. But, but what is fundamental is at the end of the day, the, the level of transparency, the ability of having an audit that reveals some of the weaknesses of the institution or their balance sheet, the way they present products to customers, to what extent they're subject to certain requirements to be clear and not lying about the products they offer. So clearly all those standards were so much weaker than the ones you would find in a typical broker or exchange. Uh, and that was the reality of, of how it worked. Uh, I think we've all been a little bit too lax when it came to crypto exchanges or cryptocurrencies, crypto tokens in the last years, because there was a sense that there was a need to leave them some space to innovate. So we cannot put the same constraints as we put in the traditional institutions. Now, I, I always felt that was a mistake because I, I was always concerned that something like this will happen or something that might be bigger than what we've seen so far. Um, I, I assume by now regulators have a very different view on what needs to be done with these markets because now they realize these markets can be as volatile or more than, than regular markets and they're large. And th there's people who, investors who lose money that they don't deserve to lose money and they should be a lot more protected. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot, uh, you're hinting at a lot of the regulations you have in Europe, in the US to protect the small investors like the per, like the people who cannot stomach losing 10, 15, 20,000 euros. Um, yeah, I, I would agree to that. And since those institutions are not really regulated that much, do you think on the side of the FTX investors, the investors working with them, did they slack a little bit on doing their due diligence there? I mean, this is an area where I'm fascinated uh, of how little due diligence they must have done. Uh, I mean, when you hear the name, some of the people who funded FTX, uh, it's even more surprising because these are all big names. Um, I mean, there is, for example, a big uh, fund in Singapore, which is a government fund, which is called Temasek, uh, th that has a massive amount of funds. And, and they had invested, I think the number is somewhere around 300 to $400 million dollars in FTX, we, they just had to write off. It is very shocking to me that someone who comes from a conservative government like Singapore, mm -hmm. they they did not have the, the the due diligence that you would expect for such a large investment. Because now that we know all the details, there was no board around FTX. Mm -hmm. It was just a couple of individuals making decisions using tools that were very primitive, like an Excel spreadsheet to record some of the biggest transactions in the fund. Uh, and clearly th th there was no CFO. Uh, and this is something that it could have been known just by asking the question, who's the CFO? What is the board? 
So it's very hard for me to understand what the due di diligence was, because again, to me, it feels obvious. I mean, I'm an academic, I'm not a, a, a hedge fund manager, or a fund investor, but you would think that the minimum set of questions you would ask is something about governance. Uh, you cannot just trust one person that might come across as very smart or very innovative. You need processes. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's to me shocking that so many millions went into this institution without that due diligence. Mm -hmm. um, you've been you've been talking about the um, a board here. Can you tell for our audience who's who's mostly with business background, but can you talk a little bit about what duties, what supervisory duties a board would have had in this situation? I mean, there are boards that work and boards that don't work. So a board doesn't guarantee that everything's going to work. But a board, the idea is to have some checks and balances. So if you are the CEO of a company, there's someone who's sort of looking at what you're doing, that, that is sort of setting some objectives, that is making sure that things are doing right. Of course, as long as the board is independent, you could imagine those checks and balances would be effective. But when you do not even have a board, to me, that's a sign that something is wrong. Um, Again, I'm not saying a board would have fixed everything in this case, but the absence of it, it just says these people wanted to have full power uh, and it's very hard to trust any organization where there is no checks and balances, where one person or a couple of people make all the decisions. Yeah, that's something we've also seen at Madoff, right? Uh, very, very secretive, mm -hmm. uh, very, very, very uh, blocked to the outside and Again, I feel a similarity because there were, if I remember uh, made of correctly, way too few people to manage the amount of money they claim to be managing in their hedge fund unit. Um, you've already hinted at um, uh, checking big transactions on an Excel sheet, which is a total no go in every regulated entity. Um, even, even my tax advisor g gave me some chewing. Um, just because I track some of my transactions, which are very, very small, um, on Excel sheets. Um, what else did you see as weak points in terms of technology there? Because they've not been built on a core system you would find in other, um, exchanges that are regulated, that are approved by the regulator, and that are through thoroughly tested. So that means even if you have an update, you have to put it in a test system, you have to test it, and then you can put it into production. Yeah, to me, the biggest issue is not quite, I mean, I, I mentioned the Excel spreadsheet because it's a little bit funny, uh, but it's not so much about the, the actual technology because one can do wonders with bad technology. I think is the lack of basic financial principles to run the business. In other words, again, the, the lack of accountability, transparency, the lack of information about where the funds are. Again, even mm -hmm. today, when people are trying to figure out what happens to these billions, billions of dollars, it is very unclear. It is very unclear where the billions of dollars went. And I get the impression, again, I, I obviously don't have all the details, uh, I get the impression that these people were running a business where they assume because their ideas are so good, the pile of money will always grow. And because the pile of money will always grow, even if I lose track of a few millions or billions, I'll have enough to pay back whenever someone asks for it. Can that, that's a little bit the impression. It just feels it, it, this is a no brainer. We, we're always going to be bigger. We're always going to grow the pie. So it doesn't matter if we lose a few millions here and there, whether I give a donation to someone, whether I lend money to someone else. At the end of the day, we just we just have so much cash that it doesn't matter. Now, of course, that, that is a really bad assumption and exposed it turned out to be a big disaster because there were holes in the system that, according to what we know today, they, these people were not aware of. Uh, and because they were not aware of, they kept betting their house on the same proposals and at the end of the day of course the hole became so big that they couldn't function anymore mm -hmm. yeah i i heard i heard some stories from people working in on non-regulated um software and then when they shifted to regulated software they uncovered a lot of problems um do you hear some stories when you're a financial services mm -hmm. consultant there um you, you've been talking about um 
the lending there and the hedge fund. Um, right now, it looks like it was very unclear between the FTX, the exchange, the broker, and their hedge fund called Almadea Research. Um, it's also, so far as I know, unclear how much money is left in this fund. Yeah, it's unclear to everyone, including to themselves. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, there was a little bit of a sort of chaos at the time where where some Bagman Fried resigned and his new CEO had to take over because there was these sort of rumors and some observations that some money was sort of disappearing. I mean, mm -hmm. some money was hundreds of millions of dollars. And it wasn't clear whether that was the new administration trying to protect some of this money or someone just stealing that money because they had access to it. So I don't think there's an answer to that. I think this, there must be some information in the hands of the new CEO, but I'm sure they don't want to reveal it because they're doing all the investigation. But clearly, what, I mean, what happened between FTX and Alameda Research is just a classic case of not keeping the, the right Chinese wall between the two businesses. Um, clearly, both businesses were run by the same people. Uh, they're trying to deny. They say, no, I didn't know this or that. But all the evidence points to the direction that all these different institutions were just uh, for the sake of sort of theater, just to pretend that they had these different functions. In reality, as I said before, to me, this looks like a pile of money. They play with it. And some of this money was not theirs, was their customers, of course. And because they had the assumption that it will always grow, that they felt superhuman. They thought it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many mistakes we made here and there, because there will always be more to pay back our customers. Uh, again, that, that sounds a little bit crazy when I say it like this, but that's to me what this business looked like. Sorry, I just had some talking points when you've been talking and uh, you just need to write them down. First, we should again uh, pick up the people who don't have any background on financial regulation. When you refer to Chinese wall, it's not like a brick and mortar wall. It's actually um, a, a way of regulating, for example, if you have a big investment bank and there's an M&A banker talking to a trader, hey, look, company A is going to buy company B pretty soon. And you know, company A, the value goes down, company B, the value goes up. So the trader can establish their positions. That may have been okay in the past but at least since the 1990s i do believe that's completely forbidden and the regulation enforced there that they cannot talk to each other about those deals that are called chinese walls so if you hear chinese walls could be something different than a brick and mortar wall um, i also read once that there is a um, that there's a saying that recessions uncover what auditors, what auditors don't. Um, I realize that the, the downhill race of the crypto currencies triggered the FTX collapse. One, under, one understanding I took from it was that a lot of those positions May, may be in one of the legal entities. We are now pretty sure there was a big mix up have been collateralized with either those cryptocurrencies or with their own FTX tokens. Do you believe that there was a lot of losses like trading losses due to those downturns that at one point just made the house of card collapse? I mean, for sure. I mean, these are, I mean, this world has been running on the idea of, again, all these tokens are going to go up in value always. Um, again, obviously, there's many tokens out there, but there's sort of a general belief that that this sector w was on its way up. Not every token, but the majority of them, and in particular some, and some people believe more in some than in others. Uh, people would use leverage. Uh, people will borrow to invest in this market because it was such a great deal. And of course, we know that it worked for a few years when the price of most tokens was going up. And then the other thing that was happening, which again, if you understand finance, is a little bit funny, although not fun in this case, more depressing, which is a lot of these tokens that had these valuations that were meaningless, meaningless mm -hmm. in the sense that th lots of tokens have been issued. There's a market where there are very, very few transactions. But let's say a mm -hmm. transaction is done at $100 per token. 
And people will say, well, a hundred dollars times the amount of tokens, this market is worth three billion. But this is not true. This market is only worth three billion if someone can buy all of the tokens at that price. But that was not true. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the trade was always so marginal compared to the volume of tokens. But then people truly believe the story and they started using these tokens for collateral. So here it is, lend me some money. I'm going to give you these great tokens that are worth a hundred dollars. But, but they were not. Uh, and the problem is everyone was doing the same thing. So, so then you have this sort of network of trades, which are all related, which mm -hmm. the moment a couple of these people start falling apart, the whole thing falls apart. Because if I ask you back for, for the payment, because your collateral is worth less, you have to ask someone else who's in the same situation as you are, and it's just not going to work. Uh, and of course, the moment we see that, people are going to panic. So maybe, maybe some of these tokens are worth something. I'm not sure, but let's say maybe. But in a moment of panic, the value of these things tend to go to zero very fast. Um, so again, that's what we've seen, not just in this case. We saw it with Terra Luna, the stable coin. Uh, we've seen it in other exchanges. We might see a little bit more of these in other exchanges. I, I don't think we've done. I think that there's still a lot of these hidden in other places. Maybe some people were a little bit better. They did not have such a, such a wild position as these guys did. But I, I'm, I have no doubt that there are other places where there's people who are insolvent, but we haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. I also do believe that we will see a few more, maybe small scale, maybe big scale insolvencies, implosions, however you want to call it, in the crypto space until the point where the global economy gets out of the recession, gets out of the corona of the supply chain funk that we are now in, the increasing inflation, and when the economy is picking up. Most of the crypto players that will be still standing, I personally do believe, will be good. But until then, we may see a few more falling out. But remember, I mean, not, not to not to disagree too much, but remember <laughs> that when these when these tokens were launched in 2008 with Bitcoin, 2009 being the first one, the main, main argument was these are tokens that will sort of compete with the traditional system, with the traditional currencies. In particular, in a financial crisis, this will be the place to go. In particular, when there is inflation, these are the tokens that will give you the best return. So here we are in a crisis with inflation. And what do we see this market disappearing in front of us? So, I mean, I find that to be very revealing when somebody tells you a narrative that says these are the tokens that will work when there is inflation because central banks are all crazy. They're causing inflation, but these are the ways to protect your purchasing power. And now that we have inflation, these things collapse in value. Again, that, that to me is a red flag, a really big red flag, because when somebody promises me a narrative and the narrative literally turns around and delivers the opposite outcome, then I'm not sure that whatever happens with inflation in the future, I'm not sure many of these tokens will stay alive. I just, I have a lot less confidence than I had before. Yeah, as Schumpeter just said, the cold shower for uh, the crypto market, I would say. Yeah, mm -hmm. very cold. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> very cold. Um, can you give us a little bit of your personal opinion? What is happening right now as we're speaking? We're recording this on the 12th of December, so approximately two weeks before this is actually um, going to be published. What is happening right now? I mean, I think with respect to FTX, we're in a state of waiting, waiting for information to come out. Uh, again, there's a process of bankruptcy that's going to take forever to be resolved. I think over the next maybe months, maybe years, we'll find out more about how many funds that are available. Uh, then slowly those funds will be distributed to some investors. Uh, but again, that's going to take years to happen. And in the meantime, the rest of the market, I think, is holding, uh, but in a very precarious way, because, again, we've seen a couple of other small exchanges uh, falling. BlockFi just became insolvent a few days or a couple of days ago. Uh, there's a lot of noise about other, some big players. There's some noise about Binance. There's some noise about Coinbase. There's some noise about Tether, as always. 
Um, so again, there's, there's a little bit of noise here and there that, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some of this noise turns into something worse over the coming weeks or months. Or maybe not, or maybe they survive because the the losses are smaller. Uh, again, I don't know because there's no transparency, so I can only try to guess by looking at their words, their body language. When someone doesn't want to do an audit, I'm suspicious by nature. If mm -hmm. you don't want to show me the assets you have, I'm suspicious. When I see the type of statements all of these players, Binance, Tether, publish, they look very suspicious to me. Mm -hmm. It would be very easy for them to do better without putting any cost on their business. There's zero cost on being more open, zero. Mm -hmm. So if they don't do it, there must be a reason. That's the only thing I can think of. Now, how bad that is that reason? How big is the hole? I don't know. But is there a hole somewhere here? Is there a risk that they don't want to share with the rest of the world? Of course there is. That I have no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, I would also add from my personal background um basically what is now happening there is a lot of lawyers and a lot of uh, forensic investigators coming into what is left of the companies and there will be a lot of work for those people but i can tell you a secret Antonio. right if ever some of those forensic peoples are turning to criminals they will be masterminds they have a more devious <laughs> mind than many criminals and they're really really good at their job at what they're That's doing good. and if there's money to be tracked, they will track it, but you need time. You need a lot of time to actually do that. Yeah. Um, going a little bit into the lookout, we've, we've already talked. There's, there's a lot of noise out here and I've made the guess when the recession is over and the players are still here on the market, they will survive. Until then, there's a 50 50 chance of, um, companies going bankrupt, companies surviving maybe even less. And I would like to take a look with you a little bit into the future, what we learned, what it means for the crypto world, because I personally do believe we will not go on as the economist once wrote, um, financial markets are defined by crashes, by um, implosions, by trouble and maybe the same will hold true for the crypto world i totally believe that we will see a lot more of the crypto world being regulated slightly less or the same as the financial world at one point in the future i, I i'm very sure there's a lot of eu um by um employees and a lot of um employees of us senators and um, members of the house that are currently writing a lot of really, really big regulations for crypto. Yeah, I think that's the future. Uh, but when you start spelling out what that future looks like for crypto, I, th I think it's not what the crypto world wants. Uh, and that's, I think that's a big issue. This is what I have in mind. In particular, if you take Europe, where regulation, I think, is a lot faster and smarter because the US is a complex world for regulation. If you take Europe, there's a new initiative called Mika, which is sort of regulating a lot of this crypto world, stable coins and things like that. It takes, in my view, a very sensible approach, which is to say, look, a lot of these things look like things that we know. We know what hedge funds look like. We know what exchanges look like. We know that what the equivalent of a stable coin is in the regular world, not in the crypto world. So if you want to do this, you're going to have to follow exactly the same rules. Exactly. There's no exception. Now, that is to me a big issue because it sort of says to the crypto world, there's certain things you won't be able to do. For example, it is very difficult to say, I'm going to run a, I'm going to run a financial institution, which is hundred percent decentralized where there's not a centralized entity which is accountable and is sort of liable for whatever they're doing, that is never going to work in financial markets. So that rules out part of the of the crypto world, the pure decentralized finance world is sort of ruled out by definition. And I think there's a few instances like this where, where the regular financial institutions, if you try to apply the same regulation to the crypto world, some of the crypto ideas will sort of disappear. Again, they're not possible anymore. So I see more regulation, but I think it's not as easy as saying, 
we're going to see more regulation. Therefore, we're just going to see the same crypto environment we see today, but with a lot of regulators around. I think we're going to move into a direction, which is we're going to see things that look a lot like the regular institutions. And some of the crypto world will not fit those definitions and they will only exist probably offshore. They, they won't be able to be registered in the European Union. And therefore, that's a very different proposition than what the proponents of of these tokens believe it can be done. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a way for making a smart regulation that can not completely kill the innovative power of the crypto world? Uh, yes and no, meaning yes, I can, I can see a way of doing a smart regulation. The question is, how do we define the innovative power? That's the big question. And so far it hasn't been defined well. The, the crypto world themselves have not articulated what are the true value they add to financial markets. Let's be honest, the crypto world has been driven by the speculative forces of investors who thought I could get rich very fast by buying these tokens. That that is the driving force of that world. If you ask what is the value of many of these innovations, call it stable coins, call it decentralized finance, call it cryptocurrency exchanges, it is not obvious. It is not obvious to me what is the value they add. That, then it's very hard to talk about innovation when you don't see the additional value. So again, I to me, the, the, the tricky part is for the crypto world first to the articulate a value proposition But then the regulators could say, okay, I understand. So I'm going to have a compromise here. Because of what you're adding to society, I'm going to adapt my regulations to you. I don't think that's the conversation we're having. I think the conversation we're having is you're doing the same thing as everyone else. You just give it a different name. You use different processes because you want to hide and in some cases be fraudulent. The regulator says, I'm, going, I'm not going to allow you to do this because I don't see the additional value in trying to tweak the regulation to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I also see that. Yes, the the value added, what would they really innovate? If they can really show it, I'm very sure there will be a lot of people employed by the European Union and the US government listening and accommodate that. But I do believe um, otherwise, it will be more or less financial service regulations and lighter or me maybe even a heavier way. And the only innovation you can do, as you said, is outside of the regulated markets like North America, like the European Union. Um, but by the way, when, when you said yes, I know you made me smile because in Germany, we do have a very good word for this. Yeah. And nine, yes, I know combined as yain. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, Antonio, thank you very much for your time. That was everything I would like to bother you with. Maybe we get the opportunity to get together anytime the next year, 2023, mm -hmm. and hopefully have a discussion on what has been going on with FTX, with the crypto world since. Of course, anytime. Anytime. Great. So it's uh, just wishing our audience Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, Frohe Weihnachten und einen guten Rutsch. You want to contribute in another language? <laughs> oh, me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, Fel Feliz Navidad, Felices Fiestas para todo el mundo. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hola. My pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.